Greetings, I'm Mitch Densley, a security training engineer at Palo Alto Networks. This video is intended to help you prepare for your PC and SE exam. The topics we're going to discuss are authentication and authorization for device administration. In this discussion, we'll talk about firewall administrative access in general, best practices of changing or removing the default admin account, how to configure authorization roles, what the administrator's list is, also how to authenticate unlisted or non-local administrators, and this will reference a vendor-supplied attribute. And finally, we'll finish up talking about multi-factor authentication. There's two different ways to define an administrator of a Palo Alto Networks firewall. The first and easiest to implement method is simply by creating an admin account in the administrator's list, and you'll see that on the device tab under administrators, and you can simply hit add. Now, this is what I'm calling a config-based administrator, where once you click add, you define their username and their password, and then the role you wish them to have. The role could either be dynamic or role-based, more on that in a minute. If you're trying to administer lots of admins, managing their usernames and passwords in this administrator list could become a little bit unwieldy. And so you can reference using an authentication profile admins whose password is not stored in this list. Your options are for the username and password to reside in the local user database, which we'll show you how to set up in a minute, or in an external user database. Regardless of whether you use local or external, you still must define the administrator's username within the administrator's list here. Unfortunately for large organizations, when you have turnover of admins, it can be quite painful to touch every single firewall and remove old admin names and add new admin names, unless you have Panorama or unless you're using a non-local or an unlisted administrator. In order to use an unlisted administrator, you have to create a server profile telling the firewall how to talk to the external server that houses the admin usernames and passwords, and then you define which admins should be able to authenticate within an authentication profile. Then, you do not put the usernames into the administrator's list. Instead, you go to Device Setup Management, scroll down to the Authentication Settings section, click the gear, and then from the Authentication Profile dropdown, specify either a single authentication profile or multiple profiles ordered in an authentication sequence. Click OK and commit, and your admin should be able to log in. And we'll show you a demonstration of this in a minute. First things first, however, it is absolutely encouraged that you remove the default admin account. Now the default admin account is a listed admin account, which means it does not reside in the local user database. It is simply defined under the device tab, administrator's list. You cannot rename the admin account, nor can you delete it while you're logged in under that account. So what we're gonna do is create a new super user account. We commit to make that account active. Then we'll log out of the default account, log in as the new super user, delete the default admin account, and then commit. It's strongly encouraged that you consider setting up password complexity for any future admin whose account is defined in this administrator's list. That way, they have to use complex passwords. It's also encouraged that you define a password profile that dictates things like password rotation. However, for greatest security, you want to minimize the number of admins locally defined in your firewall. You must at least have one, so make it a very complicated username, a very long 31 character password that no one in the organization will ever, ever use. It is simply there as backup emergency access, and every other admin has their username and password defined on an external authentication source. Before we get into a demonstration of how to create these user accounts or these admin accounts, we need to talk about roles. There are two different types of roles, and roles are how Palo Alto Networks provides admin authorization. 
aka what is this administrator enabled to do once they've authenticated to the firewall. The dynamic roles are the ones that are predefined, meaning they come with PanOS. And you can see an explanation of the dynamic role names and what privileges each have in the table at the bottom of the screen. Or you can create your own, what we call role-based, or think of it like a custom role, where you click Add, give the role a name, and then depending on which interface you want that role to have permissions for, the web UI, the XML API, or the CLI, or command line interface, you toggle the different areas of administration between enable, read-only, and disable, the superset of toggles you'll find on the web UI, a subset of those same toggles will be on the XML API tab, and then there are not command-specific permissions for the CLI. And so from the drop-down on the command line tab, you'll see the predefined roles listed there. So let's talk about how to add in the very simplest administrator accounts, what I call the administrators list admins. To do this, go to device, administrators, hit add, and supply a username and a password, and I'll show you how to do this in a moment. Now, we've already discussed how that's not ideal because if every admin's username is defined in this list, it can become a pain to administer. Your other options are to use local user database administrator accounts. I'll show you how to do those as well. Better than using the local database administrator account, you can use external user database accounts, and I'll also show you how to set them up for Radius. Let's look at how to do that now. The first thing I want to show you how to do is delete the default admin account on a Palo Alto Networks firewall. To do that, you go to Device Setup Administrators, and you'll notice that you cannot delete an account that you're logged into. So what you have to have is at least one local admin account defined in this administrator's list. But don't leave it admin, because that's half of a credential right there. So add a new admin account. We'll call this Backup Admin. And we'll give it a very strong password. If you had enabled password complexity, when you go to commit this, if the password does not conform to the complexity requirements, you'll get an error. Now what I'm going to do is commit. Then we'll log out and log in as our new admin account. Now we're going to log in as backup admin. And then now we'll go delete that old default admin account. Perfect. And we could commit and now it's gone. But before we do, I want to show you how to add some different types of admin accounts. This is an administrator's list account where the password is maintained within the configuration. But next, let's go create a local admin account that belongs to this local user database. So I'm just going to hit add. We'll call this local admin and we'll give him a strong password. Now that I've added that user, I can create an authentication profile. So to do that, I'll click add and we're going to reference a local database or a local user database. And we'll call this local admins. Now, we want to specify the minimum number of users possible. We could do this just by referencing that, that individual user's username, or if we had defined groups in the local database, we could reference them as well. But for simplicity, I'm just going to reference the local admin. So now that this local admin is added to this authentication profile, I can now make him an administrator who can log into the firewall web UI. To do this, I'm going to hit Add. We'll call this local admin, matching the same name. We will reference our local admin's authentication profile. Be sure you do not leave that at none, and then give them a role. Click OK. And now we've got a backup admin whose username and password is stored within just the administrator's list. We've got our local admin whose username is defined in the administrator's list, but his password is maintained down here in the local user database. Now what we want to add 
is an external admin, an LDAP admin. First, we need to create an LDAP server profile that tells the firewall how to talk to the LDAP server. So we'll come down here and hit add. I'll call this server 2016 LDAP. And I'll just add in my server, specify its IP, the communication parameters, whether SSL is enabled or not. Mine does not have SSL enabled, so I will turn this off and make sure that the clear text port is defined. I'll specify a type of Active Directory. And once the firewall can talk to this Active Directory server, when I hit the drop down for base DN, if it's talking to it properly, you should see it populate here with what my domain is called is lab.local. So you can see that there. Next is the bind DN. This is how we authenticate to the LDAP server. I'm gonna use just a simple admin account for security purposes, use a service account, but for my sake, I'm going to keep it simple. And then I'll supply the password, like so. And since we want to use this LDAP server profile just to authenticate admins, I'm going to check this box so that the admins defined by the server profile and the authentication profile I'm about to create can only log in to the web UI or CLI or XML API, depending on which role I give them, they cannot authenticate to the authentication policy, what you might know as captive portal, or other types of methods for authenticating to or through the firewall. So we'll click OK. We'll scroll up, and we'll now create an authentication profile. Call this LDAP admins. We'll specify our type as now LDAP. We'll reference our server profile, and then we'll define which users are allowed to authenticate. To keep things simple, I'm just going to specify all, but in a secure environment, you would want to limit this to just a set of groups who should be able to authenticate as admin. Click OK, and now I need to define my LDAP admin username into the administrator's list. But I haven't created this admin yet, so let's go do that now. I'm going to create a new user, new admin, and we'll call this admin Dan. We'll give Dan a password. And since Dan's default account belongs to the domain users, he would fall under all users, which means now he should be able to authenticate once I define his name in the administrator's list on the firewall. So let's go do that. So to do this, I'm going to hit add. We'll specify the name of Dan, and we'll reference our LDAP admin's authentication profile, and that's all we need to do. I'll click OK. Now commit, and what we'll do is we'll log out and test local admin, and we'll test Dan to make sure that they can authenticate through the firewall. OK, I've logged out, so let's log in as local admin. Sure enough, local admin can authenticate. Now let's test Dan. And Dan, our LDAP admin, can also authenticate to the firewall. Okay, so let's see what happens when the admin's name is not defined in the administrator's list on the firewall. First, to set this up, you have to define a server profile that tells the firewall how to talk to the radius, TACAX plus, or SAML server. Then you need to create an authentication profile that defines the correct server as well as which administrator should be able to authenticate. And if you wanted to set up multi-factor authentication, you would also define that in the authentication profile. Optionally, you could define multiple servers within a sequence. And then you tell the firewall that when an unlisted admin name is provided at login, reference this profile or this sequence to figure out where that user account lives. So in the example here, the user Mitch has supplied a password of password. Now, this is just being facetious. Obviously, we don't send over passwords in clear text, but the firewall queries the radius server. Is this a valid credential? And then the radius server replies back that it is valid and this user account is associated with a VSA, in this case called Corp Admin, 
and that VSA or vendor supplied attribute tells the firewall how to authorize or which admin role to give Mitch now that he's successfully logged in. Here you can see the vendor code that Palo Alto Networks uses 25461 and the different attributes that can be defined as VSAs. In the demo I'm about to show you, we're just going to use attribute one, but there are other attributes you can see that can be defined, like if this firewall is configured with multiple vSys, then you would need to define which vSys or access domain this admin should be able to administer. Or if you have panorama, then you can do the same configuration of the role and an access domain for panorama. And then the fifth attribute, if you've defined local groups in the firewall, then this admin account can be associated with a local user database group in this way. Let me show you how to set this up. The first thing I'm going to do is create a custom role, and we'll call this corp admin. And a corp admin, I want to have full access to everything on the web UI. And as you can see, everything is enabled. And I will also give them on the CLI super user permission. So I've created this role, which we'll reference later when we set up the vendor supplied attribute within the radius server. Next, we want to tell the firewall how to talk to the radius server. So I'm just going to call this SRV2016-radius. And for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to use CHAP. Then I'll add in the server entry. I'll click OK, and I will commit. And while this commit is happening, let's go set up the RADIUS server. On the RADIUS server, I'm going to add a RADIUS client. You can see I'm already in the network policy server on Windows Server 2016. We'll just call this provide an IP. And then we'll click OK. Next, we need to create a vendor supplied attribute policy such that when an admin attempts to authenticate, the radius server can tell the firewall what admin role this user should be granted. So we're going to come to network policies. We're going to right click and say new. And we'll call this policy our Palo Alto Networks USA. We'll click next. Now we'll add a condition. We'll reference a group of users. Now, since this is going to be for administrative purposes, you really should only use reference a small subset of users that are in your Active Directory. However, for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to use Domain Admin. And then I'll click Next. We'll grant access to our Domain Admin. We'll specify the authentication type. And as I did earlier, I just used chap next i'm not going to change any of these defaults so i'll just click next again then we're going to supply a vendor specific attribute or vsa i'm going to click add from the drop down i'm going to choose custom and we'll specify a vendor specific attribute and add and next we'll add the attribute we're going to supply a vendor code Palo Alto Network's vendor code is always 25461. It does conform, and we will configure our attribute. The vendor assigned attribute number we're going to use is 1, and the attribute value is going to be the role we defined back in the firewall, which, if you'll remember, we called corp admin. So we'll use the same text exactly as you see it here. Also, make sure that it is defined as a string. And click OK. And OK. Now, if your firewall has multiple vSys, then you'll also need to define the vSys1 or vSys2 ID using the same vendor code. But since the firewall I'm using only has a single vSys, we won't need to add that. Click OK.
close. And now we can see we've got our vendor specific attribute added. The value is corp admin. And then we'll click next. And then we'll click finish. Now we've got our policy set up in the Radius server. The last thing we need to do is allow our admins to authenticate using Radius. To do this, we're going to go to Active Directory Users and Computers. I'm going to add a user. We'll call this user Mitch. We'll give Mitch a password. Next, we'll add Mitch to the domain admins group. And we'll give him dial-in permission, which is needed for Radius. Click OK. Now we'll go back to our firewall. And now we need to add an authentication profile referencing that Radius server. So we'll call this Radius Admins. The type will be Radius. We will reference the Server 2016 Radius server profile we created earlier. And then we'll define which users are allowed to authenticate. For simplicity, I'm going to specify all at this point. If we wanted to utilize multi-factor authentication, we could check this box and then reference a multi-factor authentication profile, but we're not going to use one for this demo. The last thing we need to do is come up here to Setup. Under Management, scroll down. Under Authentication Settings, click the gear and reference that Radius Admins Authentication Profile. And now, admins will be able to authenticate, in this case, Mitch, even though you see there is no Mitch username specified in the administrator's list. So this is a purely external admin account who will authenticate using Radius and will be authorized as a corp admin referencing the vendor supplied attribute defined in the Radius server. Next, we'll commit and test it out. Here you can see I'm about to log in using a different browser, in this case, Firefox. And so we'll supply the username of Mitch and Mitch's password. And you can see Mitch is now authenticated as a corp admin. Okay, when it comes to multi-factor authentication, we support several different multi-factor authentication vendors, Duo, Okta, Ping ID, and as of PanOS 8.1, RSA Secure ID. First thing you do is you set up the multi-factor authentication vendor's server profile, and I'll show you how to find some videos on how to do this. Then you reference that MFA vendor server profile within an authentication profile. That authentication profile defines the first authentication factor. That usually is a username or password as defined in LDAP, Radius, TACAX, SAML, Kerberos, you name it. Then you add on additional factors that would reference the multi-factor authentication vendor's server profile. Users will see this additional factor prompt when they go to authenticate to the captive portal as defined by the authentication policy. I want to show you how to find multiple videos on setting up multi-factor authentication because the process can be slightly different depending on which vendor you have. To find the videos on how to configure multi-factor authentication for Palo Alto Networks Firewall, go to YouTube and in the search bar look for Palo Alto Networks. Come to the main page for Palo Alto Networks. Scroll down and on the right, you'll see the Palo Alto Networks Live Community. Go to that page. Next, come to Videos. And then on the Videos page, search for MFA. And you'll see there's a few entries, Okta, Duo, and others dealing with multi-factor authentication. Thank you for your time in watching this PCNSE prep video. I hope you found it valuable, and I hope it helps you pass the test. Good luck.